The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. My baby dolls, we are back again. Another episode of Genesis is coming up. As always, I am your host, Ian Kahanowitz. And as always, we're talking about old-time baseball. And uh, we're going back to 19th century here, folks. We're talking about Ed Delahanty in the Emerald Age of Baseball. And the book was written by Gerald Casway. It was published back in 2004. And, you know, the Emerald Age of Baseball is a term coined by Mr. Casway. And uh, we're talking about a lot of Irish people, in uh, a lot of Irish athletes in baseball. And not surprisingly, speaking of the Irish, this was published by the University of Notre Dame Press. It is a very good book, to say the least. Um, If you want to know about old-time baseball, as I know a lot of you folks who follow me on Facebook and who listen to my podcast, pick this one up, clear writing, 11 years went into researching and writing this book, which means that Mr. Cosway started this around 1992, 1993. We're going to ask him the details about this fine book. And, um, hey, holidays are coming, folks. You want to know about 19th century baseball? You want to know what goes on about the people that lived in it and played in it? Pick up this book. You'll find out so many little tidbits about the growth of the Irish in the cities as well as baseball when spring came and the whole traditions of Irish culture post potato famine of the 1840s and why they were so instrumental in shaping baseball in the latter half of the 1800s. You are listening to the Comfortably Zone Radio Network. I am honored to be on the network now going on, oh, about a year now since I had my surgery and I dropped dead and they brought me back to life. But previously, my show was on the Heavy Hitter Network. He retired and, of course, there was a nine-month hiatus and I'm just happy to be back on the air three to five times a week and talking about these wonderful books. Uh, we have a lot of great shows, and one of the places we go in the book is Philadelphia. Of course, we have Bill Cachetas, who does uh, Philadelphia, past, present, future, and we talk about the all-time baseball teams. We're not only talking Phillies, we're talking Quakers, we're talking Negro League with the Stars, we're talking about the Philadelphia Athletics. A lot of history in Philadelphia, a lot of 1800 history we're going to find out here uh, in El Delahanty. Also, we got Nancy Finley, the Oakland A's. We got Golenbach's University with renowned author Peter Golenbach. Hey, we got Vintage Sports with Hal Bach. We got Mark Littell and Mark Weiss and Mark and Mark in the midday. Got a lot of shows going on. We got David Finoli and Alan Blumpkin doing the Pittsburgh thing. And I'll tell you, I love Alan Blumpkin. I am so honored to be on his show with David Mamick, who is a renowned author in himself. And for most of you who don't know, he wrote the autobiography, not the autobiography, but the biography of Dr. Al Jahis, who was, um, he was accused of communism in the 1950s. He was actually the physician of the family, and he wrote a lot of trivia books by which when I was in public school, they were all announced, and um, in the uh, those uh, newspapers they used to give out for book clubs, and I used to order a whole lot of them, along with Hal Box books on 1977, 1978 stars. I'm dating myself 40 years. What can I tell you? I'm old. But anyway, let me tell you about Ed Delahanty, okay? They called him Big Ed, and you know what the problem is? He played in the 1800s, and like a lot of the people that played in the 1800s, it's it's a sad history because they're forgotten once the 1900s roll around, the 20th century rolls around. But let me give you these stats. In 16 seasons with Philadelphia, Cleveland, not the Indians, the Infants, Washington Senators, Delahanty batted 346 with 101 home runs. 1,464 ribbies, 522 doubles, 185 triples, 455 stolen bases. He also led the league in slugging average and runs batted in three times each, including uh, two years in a row, I believe, he batted 404. He batted over 400 those three times, 1894 to 1895, 1899. He batted 410. The only other one is 
is Rogers Hornsby. He's the only other three-time 400 hitter in National League history. Now, he did it two years later in 1922 and 24-25. Delahanty's lifetime batting average of 346. I think that's two more than Ted Williams. Ranked fifth all the time behind Ty Cobb, Roger Hornsby, Joe Jackson, and Lefty O'Dull. But again, O'Dull only played sporadically. Um, didn't have as many at-bats, but I'll tell you, that's one guy that should be in the Hall of Fame. Um, there is even a sports bar in Phillipsburg, New Jersey. Delahanty's Tavern on the Square, named in his memory. And so we don't hear of uh, Ed because he played in an era, like I said, that's long forgotten. Normally, when historians pick up on baseball, they usually start around the Western League, which, again, Delahanty was playing in the 1890s. You know, we'd know about the John McGraws and the Baltimore Orioles and then the whole uh, National League and American League war. And then 1903 comes, but that's what we know Ed Delahanty about, his death, that he fell off the bridge into uh, the Niagara uh, River and uh, probably went over the falls. We're not... Well, you know, historians have not been sure for a long time, but he died a ghastly death, and that's what people know him for, and there's so much to add. And we're going to get it right now. Hey, welcome to the show, Jerry. Thank you very much, Ian. Good to be here. Let me you. ask you something. Stats like this. He was inaugurated into the Hall of Fame 1945, 42 years after his death. Why did anyone construct a biography like this prior to you? Well, first of all, they had they they had to locate more information dealing with his personal life, and I lucked out on that because I located uh, the family or what was left of the family uh, in Mobile, Alabama. His widow um, eventually remarried and relocated to Mobile, and in Mobile, I was able to locate the family, and the family was very generous in letting me um, both catalog and use their materials about Delahanty's death. And one of the most important things about Delahanty's death was that they sued the railroad that had kicked them off the train uh, in July of 1903. And uh, there's a whole court transcript on real thin onion skin pages uh, that cover parts of his life and his death. And that stuff wasn't available uh, before I started looking into it. Let me ask you this. You take a lot a lot of information, and piecing this together for 11 years can't be easy, because I'll tell you, back then, you literally had to look at microfiche and all this other stuff. I get the, I get the luxury of sitting on my couch, pressing a button, and going to the Chicago Tribune on a certain date in 1926 and able to locate all this newspaper. You rely heavily on the sporting life, and the Philadelphia Inquirer, and a lot of other newspapers of the era. How tedious was that? It was tedious, but you know something? There's something with, about working with microfilm that's better than working with microfiche. Microfiche will give you the topic in the actual article dealing with that. A microfilm will let you look at everything that happened that day or that week or at that time, and oftentimes – Additional information, tangent information, is disclosed while you're doing that. So you gain so much more uh, from that kind of research than you do, do from the more narrowed, uh, you know, uh, digitized uh, uh, sources. Now they have newspapers.com, and for like a $12 a month fee, every newspaper <laughs> at any date from the 1700s to the present gets opened up and you get to see the whole article, you get to download it and print it out. And that helped a lot in my research for the uh, for the, for the Dutch Leonard affair. And I was able to get into, uh, I was fortunate, just like you had um, somebody working to get you stats, and uh, I paid a car law student to get me into Judge Landis's files. And I just received about, oh, 60 pages out of his files the other day, and it was just like, bingo. That's, uh, <laughs> I just found the treasure. So yeah, I could understand that it wasn't so tedious because when you do find information that you know you could add to your story, it's just so exciting. Now let me ask you this. We spoke about it on the last show, 
by the way, the last show got good reviews. A lot of people liked it. They uh, instant messaged me, loved the 19th cult, uh, century culture uh, of baseball, which we'll get back to in January. We spoke a little bit about the Emerald Age of Baseball. It's fitting for this show. What's the Emerald Age of Baseball? Well, in terms of trying to do a title and look at the, the, the era in which Delahanty played, the most obvious um, uh, attraction was the fact that, um, you know, almost 40% plus of all the ball players in the, the big leagues, whether it be the National League or the American Association at the time, this is all pre-American League, all pre-1901 or 1903, that the majority of the players were Irish Americans. Some were born in Ireland, but the major- overwhelming majority of these Irish players were kids whose parents had been, you know, the uh, famine refugees of the 1840s and 50s and 60s who had left Ireland during the potato famine. So I was looking for some kind of catch phrase that sort of epitomized what all this was all about. And, um, you know, I think I mentioned that the last broadcast, today about 30, 35% of all players are Hispanic or Latino. Well, back when Delahanty played, the almost more than 40%, and in some teams 60%, like the old Baltimore Orioles uh, of the 1890s under John McGraw and Ned Hanlon, they were almost 60% Irish. So how do you recognize that era? Because the era that Delahanty played in was an era dominated by an ethnic group. Which, was the, which were Irish-American kids. And they gave expression and, and character, again, to the game. So the culture of baseball, in which it circulated in the 1890s and 1880s and beginning of the 20th century, was, was Irish. So I, I, I couldn't call it the Celtic Age or the Gaelic Age or the Catholic Age. So I came up with the idea of calling it, gee, the Emerald Age. And... Um, I, what I should have done is should have had the, the phrase copyrighted because right now it's being used by a good number of people, uh, which is fine, uh, to describe the era it, in which Delahanty and many of uh, most of his, all of his peers played in. So that's how I came up with that title. It was one of those creative moments that come and go. Yeah, you know something? When I always think of the Irish – uh, in the 1840s and 50s and 60s. I'm thinking about Boston. I'm thinking about New York. I'm not thinking about Cleveland. <laughs> What's going on with Irish immigrants living in Cleveland? They followed the Erie Canal, and in the post-Civil War era, they followed industry and urban development. And Cleveland's on, Cleveland's on Lake Erie. You know? And so all of these towns, again, had work for the Irish. A lot of Irish immigrants, when they came over, uh, particularly they came over during the war, Civil War, they didn't want to come into the country. If they had a chance to go to Canada, they lived in Canada. And after the war, they began to move from Canada down to where the jobs were along the Erie Canal and the Great Lake region. And that's how that, that that area and that community began to grow and develop. It's amazing because they had five sons, I believe, all five of them played Major League Baseball. What's going on here? Well, what, what I, I believe I, I was able to deduce from my research and my exposure, both as an Irish historian and as a baseball historian. Remember, my original area for about 25 years was 16th and 17th century Irish history. So I didn't come to Irish history uh, as a Johnny-come-lately. I mean, I, I, I had a deep, deep background in it. What I had to do is move it up into the more contemporary era of the 19th century. And uh, by doing that, I began to look at the, you know, the trauma of immigration uh, and, and of the, uh, the great potato famine. And all of this created, you know, a, a push force that pushed people out of Ireland looking for opportunities. And to them, America was a, a country paved with gold. You know, 
The streets were paved with gold. They saw great opportunities here. But when they came over, you know, it wasn't that way. First of all, the country was industrializing, and most of these Irish Catholic immigrants were, again, rural agricultural workers. A lot of them didn't speak English. A lot of them spoke Gaelic. So the problem is they came into a country that where they were not as well suited as maybe other immigrants. And at the same time, they were Catholic. And the country was going through an anti-foreigner, anti-Catholic movement at the time. And so they conformed to every prejudice that existed in uh, pre- and post-Civil War America. So one of the things they found an outlet for themselves was, again, by playing a game that they had some background in. In Ireland itself, both hurling, playing with a hurling stick like a, like a field hockey game, sort of like field hockey, but it's not field hockey, or handball. I, Ireland was a major handball um, center. And you can even go today and see remnants along some of the rural roads where they dug outside of the road, put boards in there, and at, at night in the, in the summer, when it was, again, at least long evenings, uh, they'd go out and play handball. Uh, reputedly, uh, Ed Delahanty's father was uh, an unsurpassed champion at handball, and all the kids played handball to stay in shape, particularly Ed Delahanty. And, you know, I remember handball. A lot of people in the suburban areas, don't Brooklyn, really, yeah. they don't really know that, but in New York City, they have these huge handball tournaments with the rubber ball, the uh, blue rubber ball. My hand used to fall off, but I had to switch to playing paddle ball. That's a great, and they would do it in a hundred degree heat where the, the, um, it got so bad that the Brighton Beach in Brooklyn, they used to have the handball tournament, same day as the, uh, Nathan's hot dog, um, eating contest. They had the EMT, uh, wagons waiting for someone to just drop so they could throw them in and take them to Coney Island Hospital. That's how, that's how, um, rabid, uh, the sport of handball was to just give an analogy of how important it was. These guys, Jim, Tom, Joe, Frank, Willie, and Ed, they want to get out of this Irish crowded working man's hell. They started playing baseball. What got them interested? Well, the, the it, it was the baseball was developing, maturing, and gaining great popularity and making money during their adolescence. Their heroes were Irish players, again, who played in the late 70s, early 80s, and the 80s, um, in all the major cities, Cleveland, Boston, Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, Brooklyn. So these kids grew up. Now, they, first of all, as I said before, they had this bat ball, handball, eye coordination uh, background. At a time when baseball was really beginning to take off, in an urban environment in which they lived. And therefore, they were, it was a, sort of a match that was a, a natural, had natural cohesion for them. It was a game they could play. They had the hand-eye coordination. They loved the, the, the use of the bat. Some com commentaries during this, the late 19th century spoke about how Irish kids used to walk around just carrying their hurling, which was the, the, their bat. The, the hurling bat. So it, all of this stuff was there, just a matter of taking advantage of it. And if you had the, the athletic skill and uh, to play the game, then think of it this way. Boxing was dangerous, okay? Football was for whom? For the collegiate uh, students. And uh, here was a game. There was no professional football. So here was a game that they could play on the sandlots, uh, as I say in the book, the fire station up the street from where the Delahanty boys lived, it was a vacant lot. Uh, these firemen took care of the lot. They, uh, again, you know, promoted the kids and promoted their teams and uh, gave them a place to, to be. And, Let me uh, ask you this question. But playing on these sand lots and these vacant lots and not really hitting their, you know, on a baseball diamond, 
How do scouts actually pick up uh, folks like this? Well, the the reputations ultimately spoke for themselves. Local scouts began to hear about the Delaney boys, particularly Ed. And once Ed made it, again, they were interested again in his brothers. And uh, the word gets around, and they sign up with minor, what we call today minor league teams, which are not, you know, the top professional teams, but lower professional teams, and sometimes semi-pro teams. And they make a reputation there, and the big clubs maybe had one or two guys looking around the country. For example, the guy that discovered Delahanty or signed Delahanty was a traveling salesman who was going through Wheeling, West Virginia, and said, my God, look at this, look how magnificent hitter this young man is. And he let people know in Philadelphia. They get they get to give him a finder's fee. Then they send down their you know, their their own staff to look at look at the prospect and they ultimately sign them. That's how it's done. There was no official um, you know, branch Ricky type of minor league system that was in place at this time. He did play for the local Cleveland Shamrocks, I uh, do believe. Uh, that was his uh But the Shamrocks first... were they were a semi pro team. They were semi pro team. They were they you know, they'd go out there and they would bet on the game or maybe they would charge some admissions. and uh, But it was nothing that was really regular. There was no regular income. It was just guys going out there for the competition uh, um, to play the game, and uh, that, that that's how that materialized. His reputation was made with the Shamrocks. Yeah, and the thing is, and that he, he was successful with them. He Listen to this. I love this. $50 a month contract he signed with Mansfield of the Ohio State League. So now Delahanty is going local from Cleveland to playing for the state team for just $50 back in 1887, I believe. And from there, he'll move on to Wheeling, West Virginia, which is the next level up in terms of uh, you know what we would call today minor league play. And, and his next stop with Wheeling – was Philadelphia in the major leagues? Let me ask you: Was the Phillies called the Quakers when they, when uh, Delahanty broke in? They were called a lot of things, but they, they were known as the Phillies. Oh, they're still uh, well. Again, let's just take a look at uh, Delahanty for a minute. Six foot one, hundred and seventy pounds, and he's not doing well. As soon as he becomes a major league uh, uh, player, is he? What's going on here? Well, he was enamored by the fact that he's such a power hitter. Uh, even, you know, years later, you know, Delahanty broke baseballs. Remember, baseball was used for during the whole game. So by the time you got to the sixth, seventh, eighth inning, that ball was pretty well out of shape. And on a couple of occasions, he cracked the ball, broke the ball, and on another occasion, the ball actually unwound. So if you remember in the movie The Natural, a number of those little incidences, you know, with you know, with um, Robert Redford, uh, were taken, I, I believe, from the experience of Delahanty when he played again with, with the Phillies. Um, so, you know, you, you, you develop that red reputation, and um, eventually uh, it catches on. Let me ask you this question. He's young. He's naive. Everybody's trying to challenge the National League with new leagues coming out. Why did Delahanty jump to the Cleveland uh, of the Players League in 1890? Wasn't a proven league, had a lot of potential, but he, don't you money, money, and money. Okay, uh, remember th- th- this is a kid from a working class family. His father, you know, did you know uh, odd jobs. Uh, there's a large family. He wanted to show his mother that he could make money, and here was an opportunity to make money and to play at home, and the money was guaranteed. And so with the Players League of 1890, what you find is a lot of ball players ultimately decide to, you know, take advantage of that. Up to this point, ball players had very little, le- very little leverage. But the threat of creating a union league, a Players League, again, gave them an awful lot of leverage. It was ultimately um, um, uh, bankrupt 
the people who are trying to uh, conduct business in, the, in this alternate uh, league and organization. But the more important thing was that, you know, here's a young boy, young man in his early 20s, okay, from a working class background, okay, who was given the opportunity to make in a season what U.S. senators were, were making. And his season was only, what, five months at the most. Uh, so it's, it's very, very gratifying and very, very alluring. And uh, his reputation was made in 1890 when he, he actually signed three, a couple of, couple of contracts. And I'll do the same thing when the American League goes. When the American League erupts in 1901 and he begins to see some of the, a lot of his teammates, particularly Napoleon Lajoui, you know, sign huge contracts, uh, he was attracted to it. He knew he had to make his money. He had, didn't have too much more time to spend at the top level. And by 1903, 1903, he, he literally has signed three different contracts with three different teams. And um, uh, he eventually jumps from the Phillies in the National League to the Washington Nationals in the American League. And uh, that's the beginning of the end for him because of other conditions. Let me ask you this. The, 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 the whole Players League fails, and there's a lot of animosity for those who jump to the new league and want retribution and come back. Why did they take him back, Philadelphia? Because they were good ball players. They recognized talent. They recognized talent. If, you know, Barry Bonds had jumped leagues, he signed, say, with the Mexican League or the Canadian League or whatever league you want to make up, and the league folds, and there he is, You're going to tell me that no team is going to go after Barry Bonds? Yeah, you make a good point. So he comes back to Philadelphia. I love this. Look at the team that Philadelphia had from 1892 to around 1901. They had Delahanty. They had Billy Hamilton, Sam Thompson, Matt Joey, and Elma Fleck. Unbelievable. And during right. that span, God, it almost got better than that. They almost signed Honus Wagner. Huh. Unbelievable. Team and that, that, and a scout yeah. out to look at Honus Wagner. Uh, who was willing to sign with them. And um, they thought that he was too big, too large to play the infield. And there was no spot for him in the outfield. So they decided against signing him. Now, could you imagine that ball club? Unbelievable. Now, let me ask you, how many did the Phillies win um, in the championships uh, those years? None. Yeah, yeah, I figured they were overshadowed. Well... As I say in Chapter 10 in this book, baseball was won by teams who played what I called an Irish style of baseball. In other words, they knew how to finagle in the game. They knew how to manipulate the umpires. They cut edges. I mean, the best ball club of that was the old Baltimore Orioles of the 1890s um, under John McGraw and Ned Hanlon. They, you know, developed the Baltimore chop. They bunted the ball. They made sure that the foul lines sort of tilted more fair than foul. Um, they, um, <laughs> one of my favorite things was that in Baltimore, they used to put soap, soap chips near the mound. So when the pitcher went to rub his hand to dry it off, he'd get soap chips. Therefore, he wouldn't be able to control the ball well enough. Yeah. The Orioles pitchers knew about this. They didn't pick up that dirt. But other pitchers didn't, and they ran into that. Baltimore was also one of the first to have an elevated mound. Okay. So all these little gizmos, uh, again, were ways to cut corners and to play a game of ball that gave, gave the player the extra edge. Ned Hanlon was uh, a master at that. So was Charlie Kaminsky a master of that. So was John McGraw. So was Connie Mack. They wheeled and dealed to get the ad advantage. And you notice the thing in common? They're all what? They're all Irish. 
And you know something? What, what also shocked me about Delahanty was we know in the semi-modern, modern, modern um, era, like Ted Williams, he would be up at bat, everyone would shift. They would call it the Ted Williams shift because you knew he was going to hit it anywhere from second base to first base. He's not going to go to the other field. Delahanty, he could hit it to the other field. He had a strategy that wasn't even thought of This, yet. this, this is uh, the answer I didn't give you for an earlier question. One of the things that Delahanty learned early was that he was such a powerful hitter, he tried to pull everything. And he was getting very frustrated because he wasn't hitting the way he thought he could. So the manager, Harry Wright, had Art Irwin, who was the, later a manager, but also a very good, very effective strategist, took Delahanty out and said, look, you're going to get fined every time you try to pull the ball. I want you to learn how to put the ball over the second baseman's head. And so from very early on, as early probably as 1890, 1891, Delahanty became very much adept of using the whole ball field, uh, you know, for his batting. And I think that was a very key factor. I'll tell you another key factor, besides his, his ungodly home runs, which, again, no one hits a home run in those years, because the ball's pretty much by, like cabbage by the fifth inning. You know, using one ball, it's spit on, it's rubbed on, there's dirt on, there's tobacco juice on it. You know, it kind of looks like kind of looks like an ostrich egg that's uh, a can of cabbage that's peeling. What makes this really special is he had the ability to be patient and take a walk if he needed to. That's true. That is true. I mean, because of Delahanty's lifestyle, which I believe is overrated and overstated, okay, and I think I try to indicate that in the book, okay, uh, he, he's a lot more, he's a lot less, um, uh, he's much more temperate than his reputation at the time. But the key is, is that Delahanty was a student of the game. He was a good base runner, stole a lot of bases. He was a good strategic player. His problem was he did never wanted the responsibility to be a captain or a manager. Delahanty was just sort of like a free spirit. He lived to play baseball. He lived for batting and hitting and uh, for winning ball games. But they didn't play the style of ball despite Sam Thompson and Napoleon Lajoie and Elmer Flick and Ed Delahanty. They didn't play the kind of ball that was winning. Small, what, what we call today small ball, was effective. The Baltimore Bean Eaters, the Baltimore Orioles, the Boston, um, um, the, the Brooklyn Bridegrooms, the uh, Cleveland Spiders, they all played small ball. They you know, play for the run, move the runners across, manipulate a, a game where only one umpire officiated and intimidate that umpire, a la John McGraw, that was the way they played. And as, and as a result, again, uh, Philadelphia never won. They would always, they would all struck, you know, their opponents with their power and their natural ability. But they never had the wherewithal, again, to play a smart game, the kind of game that the Orioles ultimately would popularize and, um, and and prove successful. And getting back to what you were saying, with get it, you know, get it over the infielders' heads, when outfielders, because they looked at Delahanty and they said, "Wow, man, this guy is powerful." They're moving back, and so when they moved back, Delahanty it opens up the whole uh, shallow outfield. Yeah, yeah, and so his ability to adjust his hitting approach to confound the defense made him. In, in the estimation of Cincinnati Reds pitcher, Red Errett, the hardest man in the league for pitches to puzzle. And longtime catcher Jack O'Connor, he concurred, saying if Dell had a weakness at the bat, he never discovered it. Now, if you think that's impressive, tell me about his fielding. Well, he was a horrible infielder. He, well, he wanted to play shortstop or second base. And he was just too big. Um, uh, and he had a very, very strong arm. 
and a very erratic arm in the infield. And when Harry Wright decided to put him in the outfield, they found his position because he had the speed, he had the powerful arm, and he covered a lot of ground. Uh, he was considered to be, at the time, uh, the best left fielder in baseball, although he played a very good center field when Billy Hamilton was an in center field. Now, let me ask you this about his personal life. He got married young, but he got divorced also. Uh, no, he never got divorced. Never got yeah, divorced. Yeah, I mean, what kind of, you know, personality did Big Ed have? Well, he married very young. Um, she was really underage. And um, she was really a neighborhood groupie who uh, attracted his attention. And they married. Um, well, they courted and, and then they married. But the key with her is that she was very immature. She really uh, wanted to enjoy the, the lifestyle of being married to the great Delahanty. And remember, he made a lot of money in those days. And these guys lived well, well beyond their means. What's amazing is that Delahanty never had an off-season job. He lived, his occupation and livelihood was being a Delahanty, period. And this was, uh, this was an era before popular commercials. Uh, there are, are a few advertisements in which he and Napoleon largely capitalized. But for a good-looking guy like him, you know, he was just, you know, coming to a bar and buy him drinks, go into a restaurant, pick up the bill, pick up the tab. She loved that lifestyle, and uh, she was never uh, strong enough to handle his personality, never strong enough to handle all of his weaknesses, which was that he would try to appease and please everyone, and when he would go on a drinking binge, which wasn't often, he was very difficult to control, and she just couldn't control him, and um, she was not, uh, didn't have the maturity to know how to handle him, and at the same time, she, she, what he needed was his mother. He needed a Bridget Delahanty, a strong matriarch. Instead, he had, you know, uh, a young girl who just couldn't handle a, a person of his stature and of his uh, uh, of his potential. And the end result was that they, they had one child. Uh, but there were some number of miscarriages, which didn't help the marriage either. And remember, wherever Delahanty went, he was Ed Delahanty. And um, although there are not, you know, uh, I never saw any justifications in primary sources that he frequented this place or that place, and he had uh, prostitutes and he had showgirls, or whatever. I never saw that. Okay. Uh, and it was interesting, when they talk about players that were drinkers and uh, carousers, his name never never comes up in the newspapers, never. So either he was very discreet about it, or he just didn't do it. And when he did go on a drinking binge, it was because of stress and, um, and pressure. And when he, that happened, he couldn't handle it, couldn't handle it. And she couldn't handle him. What he needed was Bridget Delahanty. He needed his mother. And, you know, and, you know, with all his success, and believe me, you know, with all those times he hit 400 and, uh, you know, he's at Delahanty in the off season, he stays in shape, doesn't need a second job. By the end of 1902, you know, his wife, Noreen, was ill, and he just squandered the whole, the whole fortune, gambling, drinking, mounting debts. What's going on with Delahanty in his, uh, in his final years here? Well, you know, first of all, I thought that making that much money, particularly there were three offers on the table for him, John McGraw's Giants, the Phillies, and the Nationals. And he was willing to take money from anybody. He knew that he only had a couple more years left in baseball, and he wanted to maximize it. He was playing on the fact that he was a Delahanty. And all these guys had very, very um, uh, uh, affluent and uh, permissive lifestyles. 
Now, one of the things I got from the family was Bella Haney's horse racing betting book where he kept tabs of things. Well, I mean, he, he bet a lot of money uh, in Washington at racetracks or in New Orleans in the off season in their racetracks and lost a lot of money. And the more money he lost, he thought that he could sort of double up on it and, and take baseball, you know, um, um, salaries that were promised to him and get advances on, the, on those contracts. And uh, they got money by winning again at the horse races, which didn't occur. So by, the, by 1903, he is financially in bad shape. His wife is really giving him all kinds of aggravation. Uh, they're having problems both financially and personally. And he knows his career is on the brink, and he can't get what he really wants, and that is to play for big, big money in New York under his crony, John McGraw. And the end result is the pressure gets too much. And how does he respond to pressure? He drinks. He drinks. And as he began to drink, his play began to um, suffer, and the end result was that um, it ultimately broke him down um, in, in, uh, D- in uh, D- Detroit. His mother has to come from Cleveland um, to sort of help him dry out. And um, he just can't handle stuff. And he sees where other ball players are getting toleration for signing multiple contracts. And he's not given the benefit of the doubt, which even you know, creates all kinds of additional aggravation and anxiety for him, which creates more drinking. And what he was, what he was doing when he died, what he, was, he was taking the train from Detroit on his own, okay, took his spikes, his baseball glove, he was traveling to New York. He was going from Detroit to Buffalo and Buffalo to New York to meet up with whom? John McGraw and play for the Giants, uh, despite what the league said. And on that train, he began to drink. He was cast off the train. Um, he tried to walk across the, 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 the bridge, the railroad bridge, which is still there, by the way. I have pictures of it in the book. And on that bridge, at night, without lights, he's confronted by an old night watchman. There's a tussle on the bridge. He apparently trips on one of the rails, falls into the Niagara River the fast-running Niagara River, and very close to where he was at, all these huge rocks and boulders. Bella Henning was an outstanding swimmer, outstanding swimmer. But, you know, <coughs> oh, but uh, um, being uh, uh, intoxicated, falling in the water at night, hitting rocks, was too much. And before you knew it, he disappeared. A week later, they find his body at the Maid of the Mist at the bottom or the foot of Niagara Falls. It's been mutilated. It's been, uh, his, his clothes have been washed off. And there was the great Delahanty. An amazing story. You know, the, um, the, the uh, bridge uh, watchman, still, you know, in his testimony, um, a lot of people blame them for killing Delahanty. They maybe pushed him. But he said either Delahanty fled and jumped off the bridge or he tripped and fell. Either way, it was in front right. of him, but it was too dark to he, see. He didn't jump. He wasn't pushed. Remember, I had the court records, okay? Right. And in the court records, what they, what they all say was that he was trying to get away from the night watchman. He tripped on the track. There was no gate that was up. All that stuff was said for the sake of the trial and for the sake of, pu- of negative publicity. He, he, he was intoxicated. It was dark. He tripped. He fell in. And that was it. That was it. There was no recovery from that. Again, it was pitch black. There were no real lights out there. He hit the rocks and the fast-moving current. And a couple of miles down the river was Niagara Falls. Yeah, I mean, and let's let's just go back a second. Because of his mounting debt and the the whole baseball uh, civil war between the uh, American League and the National League, in 1903, the war comes to an end. Now, Delahanty, 
he tried to benefit by going to McGraw for a six thousand or an eight thousand dollar contract. They gave him That's four thousand. Huge amount of money in those days. Yeah, four thousand dollars they're giving him up front. That's going to help pay a lot of bills. And what Absolutely. happened? Absolutely. And what He's happened? already in debt because they are already giving him advances. Yeah. And, and what happens? The leagues patch up, and they void the contract. And now they already gave him the uh, the uh, the uh, advancement. He has to go pay it back. That's right. That's why he decided to take, started to drink and take things into his own hand by taking his glove and his shoes, the spikes, and going down to New York and playing for the Giants. He and John McGraw were very good friends. John McGraw is one of the few baseball people who showed up in Cleveland for his his, uh, his funeral. Yeah, you mentioned that. And uh, Noreen, his, his uh, wife, ended up uh, going on marrying another guy. I yeah. don't think it was a good marriage either, uh, if, I, if memory uh, recall, if I recall. Well, she 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 she, she, she marries this guy. Um, from Violin, New Jersey. Uh, he's a, sort of an inventor of sorts. They moved down to Mobile, Alabama. Uh, they have a very good life. But just just like her mother, uh, I mean, Noreen will ultimately continue to be, again, this very shallow, very, uh, 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 you know, affluent-seeking, you know, woman who just wants the better and finer things in life. And uh, there'll be some tensions again with her new husband because of this. And uh, her daughter uh, from Ed Delahanty is very much the same. Has the same type of attitude, same type of value system. And you get that from reading the, the personal correspondences and looking at the court records. If, you, if there's one thing you want people to remember about Big Ed, what would it be? He was brought probably as an accomplished uh, uh, ball player as, as there was in the 19th century. And he was, a, you know, a magnificent hitter. A magnificent hitter. And, um, you know, people ask, you know, how would he have done today? Well, I, I, I think... All ball players, if they were great in one era, would be great in the other era, but maybe in a, in a different context. But a guy like Delahanty would have been a great outfielder, and he would have also been a great hitter. Now, how many other ones he would have gotten, whether he would hit 400, how he would handle all this, you know, very um, detailed, fine pitching, you know, that, you know that's something to, to behold. But, you know, you have – you have to judge the ball player based on who he played with and the era in which he played, and then try to see whether how that translates into a different era. You know, I always like to say, you know, he's one of the five tool players, one of the few. I'll name two others that's probably in his likeness, Tris Pica and Willie Mays. And those are the kind of guys you can compare to Delahanty because they were, they could do it all. They could throw a ball, um, you know, from the outfield. They could hit through something. They had power. Um, you know, Tris Speaker ended up being an awesome manager. And, of course, in 1920, um, you know, in the face of uh, total destruction uh, during that whole um, Carl Mays and, uh, you know, Chapman dies, and then he brings the uh, Indians to uh, the promised land and wins the World Series, um, I guess the Dodgers, you know, true speaker, and of course Willie Mays comes to mind. Excellent book, uh, Gerald. Um, I always have a great, uh, you know, time reading your books. This one, this one, uh, I we spoke before the show, and I like to tell, you know, my uh, listeners that look at this period of time, you know, the dead ball era, the 19th century ball players. Um, the, you know, an interest has started to get, uh, because it is the turn of the new century, and now you're going back 100 years. But when you ask me, is this the, um, you know, this is the kind of book that, uh, you know, uh, would stand out and, uh, you know, be like uh, something that other people would, you know, use or uh, emulate in its, 
research and its writing style, absolutely. It is a good book, a very good book. And hey, the book's uh, available both in paperback and hardback. Hey, uh, we, I'll, we I'll let you do the talking. Go ahead. Where can we find it? Um, I, at this stage, I don't know, but I know they can be ordered on Amazon. I've seen the book um, on eBay. Um, just try to get the best price and, and buy it. Yeah, it is well worth it. I see that it, it is well worth it, and uh, you know, it is it is an important part of baseball history that not a lot of people know about. To tell you the truth, if you would go back five years. Um, Prior to the day we're speaking today, I probably would have known very little to none about 1800 baseball. It's only when I, you know, gave up being a full-time attorney when I got sick, and when I was able to uh, spend many times in bed that I researched and I did my, um, you know, thing on Facebook, and I educated myself and realized uh, what they like to call the beer and whiskey leagues of the 1880s and the Western League, which was formed by Van Johnson, and early 20th century baseball going to 1919. I got a full history, and I, and I was able to open up my own site on Facebook, Ty Cobb and the Dead Ball Era, and um, guys like Ed Delahanty always somehow fall onto a post or something, and a lot of people comment and say, hey, I haven't heard so much about Ed, you know. I, I learned about Ed, you know. I was in the Philadelphia area, and I grew up, and we always knew about Delahanty, but the rest of the country don't. So that's what I try to do. As always, Jerry, you've been a great guest. Hold the line, because I always uh, speak to my authors after I get done. Folks, I had a great time with Jerry again. Go out, get Ed Delahanty in the Emerald Age of Baseball, published by the University of Notre Dame Press. Excellent book. I highly recommend it. Get it for the baseball lover and your family for the holidays. I don't care what holiday uh, you celebrate, I don't discriminate. Hey, I can even celebrate Festivus, just like Jerry Seinfeld did. Go out, get it, it'll keep you warm in the winter. As always, I'm Ian Kahana with Thank You, Gerald Casway, for being on the show. Hold the line. And you are listening to the Comfortably Zone Radio Network. And as I always end the show with one of my all time heroes, Edward Almuro, in his immortal words Good night, folks. Good luck. We'll see you next time.